morning, church. Our scripture reading is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Paul here writing to the young Timothy preacher as he's given instructions on the qualities, first of elders, overseers. Now we're going to be looking at the qualities of a deacon. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their households well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Preach the word, brother. Good morning. What a blessing to be here today. We... Um, we often take for granted these opportunities, and I, I think we, we need to reflect upon just what a blessing it is to be here. Um, God has been good to us. Um, we, we are here, we have the health, we have the minds to comprehend. Uh, we have a church family to sing these songs with and to um, study, to commune with around the table. Uh, we are very blessed, and God is very good to us. And as we just sang, great are you, Lord. He truly is great. Um, so glad that you're here to our members, but uh, to our visitors especially, thank you for being a part of our assembly. Uh, we are very honored by your presence and hope that, uh, that you will come and visit with us again very soon. I have a couple of prayer requests that were uh, put in the plate a few moments ago that I would like to, uh, uh, to share before we begin this morning. Um, this comes from uh, Terry Williamson. Uh, Billy Owens, a longtime neighbor and friend, was just diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And he's been given a month to live. I want to pray for Billy and his family and also for Terry and her family at, at this time. And from Jarrett, uh, for her daughter, Kimberly Archie, and the Archie family at the death of her father, Cornell Archie. And that was about a week ago, wasn't it? A week ago Thursday, a week ago Thursday, uh, this, past Thursday. this past Thursday, excuse me, okay, um, for peace and comfort uh, for her and for her family. Uh, would you pray with me as, as we begin this morning? Father, you are truly a great and awesome God. We are blessed to come into your presence, Father, knowing that through the name of Jesus you hear us. We are grateful for his mediation in our prayers, and Father, we petition you now as we enter into another portion of our worship that you bless us as we study from your word, that you would instill within us, Father, the, the things that we need to know to be reminded of the things perhaps we have uh, not focused upon, and to encourage us, Father, as we, we look there to improve our lives and to encourage those round about us. Father, we pray that you would be with Billy Owens and his family and his diagnosis of stage four cancer. Father, we pray that you would bless them with comfort in a very special way. That you'd be with Terry as she, she seeks to minister to this neighbor and to encourage him during his final days. And for Kimberly and, and her family, Father, and the loss of her dad, we pray for comfort and peace. Death, even under the best of circumstances, is, is difficult. And we pray, Father, your blessing to be upon her. Bless us, Father, we pray, and thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been engaged for about seven weeks now in a number of lessons on leadership. And we began by examining Nehemiah and the importance of, of looking at the examples that he gives us and how he had a vision 
and how he applied that vision to action. When he saw a need, he acted upon it. And so we translated that into the New Testament. And we looked in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16, verses 11 and 12 in particular, that says, And he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the works of ministry, ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. The importance of having proper leadership, visionary leadership, is critical for the body to be equipped and to be built up. And so we looked for a number of weeks there following at pastors. And of course, in the New Testament sense, the, the pastors are the elders, the bishops, the overseers, the shepherds of the flock. And we looked at not only what their role is, but those men who would have the characteristics necessary to qualify them to serve. Today we're going to look at the same with God's special servants. Those who, who serve as deacons within the body of Christ. Now, as uh, you may recall from last week, and if you were not here last week, I want to remind you, that uh, for those who filled out the surveys, uh, thank you once again. Uh, as Gene mentioned earlier, lots of great things there. Uh, we're working diligently to go through 18 pages of information as it was all compiled. And there are several areas we're going to be focusing on uh, on the front end because they were the areas that you had the most to offer as far as encouragement and direction. Uh, the facility issue that he spoke of uh, is a big concern for a lot of people and for, for the right reasons. We are limited in classroom space. We have no parking, all of these kinds of things. And so we're going to look at all of the options. This committee is going to do a great job under the leadership of John and, and Jean-Pierre. And so we're, we're very thankful uh, for your input there. But another aspect of the survey was asking if you had anyone that you would like to see um, in the near or even distant future serve this congregation as an elder or a deacon. And so if you did not fill out a survey, if you did, we have your responses. Those have been recorded, and we want to add to that. So if you did not fill out a survey, these forms are available back here, and there's a box. And if you didn't fill out a survey, if you would kindly, if you have an opinion of uh, an individual or individuals to serve in this capacity, please give us your, your uh, input. We would very much uh, welcome that. We'd like to have this back by next Sunday. So if you would fill those out and return those by next Sunday, it would help us as we move forward, moving into the new year. So thank you in advance for that. So we want to talk about deacons this morning. What is a deacon? Well, the word that is translated deacon refers to one who executes the commandments of another. It's a servant, an attendant, or a minister. And this word is used many different ways in the New Testament. Many of which we're not going to be discussing today, but I want to touch on them very briefly just to show you the different ways that the word is used. First of all, Romans 13, 14 tells us that the government is a minister, a deacon, if you translate it literally, a deacon to carry out God's wrath upon evildoers. The word deacon is used in that sense. That is the same word where it says it is minister or servant that God uses. In Romans 15 and verse 8, uh, there's a uh, mention that Jesus Christ was a deacon, a servant, a minister. The word has a broad use. And then in Romans 16 and verse 1, we see there was a lady who was a servant or a deacon. That's in Crea. Now, all of these are important, and all of these usages are important, but these are not the usages that we're talking about this morning. 
This morning we want to talk about the office of deacon, the official position. Now, before we move forward, I want to say something. It has been my experience in the body of Christ that the best deacons in the church are the women, even though they can't serve in the official capacity according to the qualifications that we have because it's impossible for a woman to be the husband of one wife. Okay? But the best deacons, the best servants in the church everywhere I've ever been are the women. I got one amen from a man. The rest of you guys are asleep. I'm going to say it one more time. The women are the best deacons in the church. That's the truth. They are the best servants, and without the women, the body of Christ would shrivel up and die. It truly would. I'm telling you. So we need to appreciate uh, the servant leadership of our ladies as they do so much behind the scenes, not up front, but behind the scenes, which is critical. Because you know, I'm standing up here today, okay? And there are a lot of things that I could do without anybody's help. But, you know, there are a lot of things that have been done in preparation for me to be able to be here that couldn't be done without those ladies in their service. The fact that many of you have a knowledge of some sort about what we're talking about today probably means that you sat in a class at the feet of a lady at some point in time in Bible class and she taught you some of these things. Maybe your mother or your grandmother did. Who knows? But we, do, we don't want to disregard the service uh, of our ladies, but we are specifically talking about the office within the leadership of the body of Christ today. Now, we note that there's a plurality of deacons in the body of Christ, just as there is a plurality of elders. And we see that noted for us there at the opening statement in Philippians chapter 1. Now, our scripture reading this morning, and thank you, Jonathan. It was a last-minute thing. Our scripture reader was unable to be with us today. And appreciate uh, Jonathan very much and uh, the capable way in which he presented God's word to us. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Likewise, deacons. This word likewise follows what we looked at were the characteristics described in 1 Timothy with reference to men who are qualified to serve as elders or bishops in the church. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. We currently here at Puyallup have two men serving in this capacity. And I don't want to undermine these guys because these guys do a lot and have done a lot. But folks, we are short of deacons in this church. And we need some men to step up. We really do. And we've got a list about that long so far. And we're either going to get confirmation of the ones that are on that list or maybe a name we haven't thought of from some of you as you fill out these forms. And we're going to be talking to these individuals with reference to whether immediate or at some point in the future, them serving in the office of deacon in an official capacity so we can have responsible individuals over the different ministries in this congregation. This is a deficit situation for us. It truly is. And we're working on it. I've, I've been pushing. That's, you know, that's why that, it was on the survey. I've been pushing. Talk, talk to Bob and Gene and, and Chris and the rest of them. Talk to them. You know, this, this is something... And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say something, Bob. Okay, and I, and I I, I know you, you're Bob's a good man, but I'm gonna tell you, I, I've I've been on Bob since I've been here about his.
about him waiting tables. That's what deacons do. Elders don't wait tables. Deacons do. But because we are short, the elders have had to do some things or they've been doing things where others can't do them. Whichever way that is, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what the facts are as we've got it right now. And to free these men up and others who are going to come alongside them to serve as shepherds of this congregation, we need men to do the serving so our elders don't have to wait tables. We need that. So, here we are. Likewise, deacons, they need to be reverent. Now, what does it mean to be reverent? It means to hold something in high esteem. And specifically, the things related to New Testament Christianity. Specifically, the church, the leadership in the church, the, the position of teachers within the church, the others that serve in the church, the ministries of the church. All of these things need to be held in high esteem uh, to a person who is qualified to serve. Not double-tongued. We don't need deacons who are saying one thing to the elders over here and going over here to the members and saying something else. How, how, how much unity would there be in the body if we had that problem? It would be very difficult, would it not? Not given to much wine. We talked about this with the elders, and we don't need uh, men serving who have uh, an, an incapacitation about them. We need men who are clear-minded individuals who are, are not impacted or influenced in such a way. Not greedy for money. I saw Hugh here a while ago. He's one of our deacons, and I'm not pointing him out because he's greedy for money. <laughs> I'm pointing him out because this man, what, 20 years you've been counting the money? Okay, 20 years he's been counting the money. Now, if we have put a man in as a deacon, and their responsibility is to count the money, and they're greedy for money, do you think we might have a little bit of a problem there? Certainly we would. Thankfully, we have someone we can trust, and I know Mike helps him out, and there are others who have helped out on occasion, and we're thankful that we have men that we can trust uh, with the money. That's important. This is a weekly offering that we take up. This is... Uh, a sacrifice that we make, so to speak, in we giving of our goods for the, to collect together for the furtherance of the body of Christ here in our evangelistic outreach and building up of the body and all of these things. And if we're putting $10,000 a week in and we're only getting $5,000 back out, we're going to have a problem. We need people we can trust. And that's, that's exactly what that comes down to. Holding the mystery of the faith. Now, I want to stop here for just a moment because this is a very critical part of our, our uh, discussion. And please join me in Ephesians chapter 3, if you would, briefly. There's this idea of, of this mystery. Now, the word mystery in the New Testament doesn't mean what we want the word mystery to mean in American English in 2016. To us, in American English, mystery is something that we don't know that we're trying to search out. A mystery in the New Testament sense is something that was previously hidden that is now being revealed. Okay? Something previously hidden now being revealed. Because if, we, if deacons were holding fast the mystery of the faith, then they would be keeping it to themselves, wouldn't they? And they were leaving it for other people to have to figure it out if we used our definition of the word mystery. It's something previously re revealed now being, or previously hidden, now being revealed. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly all written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known, to the sons of men, but now has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Here's the mystery. 
that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in faith through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Now, that in the general sense, it's broader than that. In the specific sense, the mystery was that the Gentiles were to be fellow heirs with the Jews. They had a problem with that in the first century because the Jews who had been uh, made stewards of the oracles of God thought it was just for them when Jesus came. And Paul says, no, it's for everyone. It was always for everyone. That was always part of God's plan. And so in the general sense, with reference to our deacons, they need to understand the importance of the gospel for everyone. And they need to hold it true to what it says and what it teaches. They need to be versed within the scriptures, not scholars necessarily, but it would be great if our deacons were all scholars. But they need to be versed within the scriptures to the point that they can understand the things that are right and wrong when they hear those things taught, when they read those things, and be able to share those things with others. This is an important aspect of serving as a deacon. They need to be tested. These individuals need to be given some responsibilities, see how they are handled, and then be put to work in the official capacity. And so there are a number of you, and um, I've talked to uh, the elders over through this process, and on the front end, I'm going to be doing my Timothy duties. As the evangelist, as Timothy was, he was to talk to these individuals. And I'm going to go through the list, and I'm going to talk to these individuals and come back and, and give them to the elders and let the elders sort through what I've, I've found out about these, these folks. And so being tested is, is an important part of this. When, when you are given a responsibility, even if you're not even looking for the office of deacon, you don't desire the position, what should you do when you're given a responsibility? You should carry it out with diligence to the best of your ability. And if a person can't do that, should we trust them to be, hold the office of deacon? No, we should not. Blameless. This word is found with our, our elders or bishops previously in the same passage. Blameless uh, literally means no unrepented of sin. In other words, keeping short accounts with God. Recognizing your faults confessing and asking for forgiveness of those faults and moving on and trying not to repeat those things. But, you know, how we are, we do make mistakes. We do repeat things from time to time, but we don't allow those things to drag out. When, when we recognize a wrong, what do we do? We stop and we, we ask for God to forgive us of that. If we need to go to an individual and ask for forgiveness, we go and we ask for forgiveness and we move on. And so being blameless, that's the type of individual um, that we're talking about. A husband of one wife, we talked about this last week. Uh, it's important to understand this. You have to have a scriptural wife to serve in the office of deacon. You have to be married to somebody that, that God sees that marriage as a valid marriage. That's an important thing. Ruling your children and your household well. Once again, just as the same thing was said of elders, the same thing is true of deacons. If we're going to give somebody responsibilities in God's house and they can't be responsible in their own house, how do we know they're going to carry out their work effectively? Well, we don't. So we need to make some assessments of, of what uh, type of home life the individual has. Now, I want to take you to Acts chapter 6, and this is lay a little bit of groundwork for what we're going to talk about next week. Acts chapter 6. And what we've just read describes a man who has the characteristics that make him eligible or qualified to serve as a deacon in the Lord's church. I'm going to tell you, Hugh and John are not perfect men. And they'll probably look at this list if they get real serious and say, you know, I don't know if I'm qualified or not. They're qualified. 
We can't make these things such hard and fast that nobody's qualified. And I've, I've seen that happen before. We've got to be careful about that. We have to judge with mercy and judge with grace. But we also have to be diligent to make sure that we put responsible individuals in their place. In Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, we read the following. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now this is the Jewish Christians of Jerusalem were the Hebrews. The Hellenists were the dispersed Jews who were Greek-speaking. The Hebrews would have spoken Hebrew. The other Christians would not have spoken Hebrew. And that was the reason for the Old Testament being put into Greek about 200 years before Christ, because of the dispersion. So there became uh, some difficulties between them. What was the difficulty? Because their widows, the Hellenist widows, were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. I've heard arguments both ways that these guys are not officially deacons and all this, and they may not have been officially deacons as what is described in 1 Timothy. But the point is, they serve the exact same role as a deacon. And I want you to look at why they needed deacons. Why did they need deacons? So the leaders could give themselves to the things that they were called to do. That is the point of having deacons who serve. And also, deacons who serve many times become elders who serve. It's an important thing for us to understand. It frees the elders to be shepherds. It, do they carry out the work of the church? They are given responsibilities, and they take the responsibilities. They don't need to be micromanaged. They need to be free to do their job within the guidelines that they are given. And they attend to the needs of others. Here specifically, the, the issue was daily distribution to widows. But there are, it goes much broader than that. But look at the result with me for just a moment. When the leaders were freed up to lead, the way they had been called to. And men stepped up to serve, to free the leaders to lead. Look at the result. The word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Folks, when we organize ourselves and conduct ourselves the way that God asked for his New Testament church to be organized, we're going to increase. We're going to grow spiritually. We're going to grow numerically. We're going to be able to do the things God has called us to do in a more effective manner in our place and in our time. We need to be serious about this. We really do. Because we were not called by God to mediocrity. He never calls Christians to mediocrity. He calls for us to reach higher. And the only way we can reach higher as the body of Christ in Puyallup is for us to get to work the way we need to get to work. To make sure that our leadership is structured correctly, that all the parts are functioning in their proper manner, and that we are moving forward with spreading the word of God in our community. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 13, it 
I just want us to focus on the first part of this verse. Let us walk properly. This is an admonition uh, to not sin here. But I want to use it as an admonition to us to walk properly as the church in our place and in our time. There's a proper way and there's an improper way. And we need to be about doing things properly or as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, decently and in order. We have to be organized correctly and working together, not against each other. We need to make sure that we apply ourselves to such things. As I mentioned, Jesus did not establish his church for confusion. He didn't establish us to be disconnected, and he didn't establish us to rest upon our laurels. We're to get to work. And in order for us to get to work, we need workers. And just because you may not be a person who has those characteristics described here doesn't mean that you can't work and you can't help. Every single person in the body has a role to play to move things forward in the body of Christ. Because Jesus died for you. He died for your sins. He placed those sins on deposit, awaiting the time when you would choose to obey his gospel, putting him on in baptism, so that blood could be applied to your life, you could be washed clean, and you could walk in newness of life. We don't need to keep that to ourselves. We need to share that with others. And we've got to get to work. If you're here today and, and you've never done that, you happen to be in our assembly today and you've never put on Christ in baptism, Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to belong to him. He wants you to be a New Testament Christian, believing in him, confessing his beautiful name before men, repenting of the sins in your life, and as I mentioned, putting him on in baptism, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins, that you'd be raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life. Or maybe you're here today. We've had a number of people lately come forward. And I'm so thrilled that hearts are being moved and people are being changed. Maybe you're here today as a Christian and there's some discouragement, some other things that are, that are troubling you. Maybe there's an illness that has befallen you. Whatever it is that you have need of, we want to pray with you, encourage you, help you in some way. Bob's about to lead an invitation song for us. And if you need to respond to obey the gospel and put on Christ in baptism, or if you need to respond for prayers, we make that available to you at this time. Won't you please come as together we stand and as we sing.